Hello, lovely people. Welcome back to my channel. Today, I am joined by the lovely Secular Spirit, and we are going to be talking a little bit about Islam, how we discuss Islam, the problems with Islam, critique versus Islamophobia. It's going to be super, super interesting. Secular, would you like to just introduce us briefly to who you are? Uh, yes, definitely. I, I should also first say uh, thank you so much for having me on here. I really appreciate it. And I've been a fan of your channel for a very long time. And I'm so glad that you responded when I reached out. And yeah, so uh, my channel is called Secular Spirit. You can find me on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram. And I focus mainly on Islam, but for the most part, it's about religion and how religious ideas harm us and how we can potentially do better with a more humanist secular perspective and yeah i've been doing the channel for a year and i come from a ex-muslim background and secular spirit is not my name not my birth name and i use a fake name for the channel as well ali which is spelled a-l-e-e-m and i'll get into why i use a fake name later on in our discussion so yeah, that's my my intro right there. Fabulous. And thank you so much for reaching out and for joining me. This is definitely the area where I am uh, nowhere <laughs> near the expert. You're the expert in this situation. Well, I did um, notice one of the reasons I reached out to you is because I noticed that you talked a lot about Christianity and religion in general, but I noticed mm -hmm. that you hadn't really touched the subject of Islam. So I was also reaching out to kind of ask, uh, is there a reason for that? And I guess we'll get into that a little bit too. Shall we start with a little bit about your background, why sure. you kind of do your channel, uh, and then we can talk about why I haven't been talking about Islam. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll give you the long story short version. Uh, you can find the full, long, boring, two-hour version on my channel. Uh, the very so... <laughs> interesting and exciting, cool <laughs> version. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I need, I need help with the self-promotion for sure. <laughs> uh, so I was born... Uh, in the, the Middle East, in Dubai, the United Arab Emirates. I come from a Palestinian background, and so I was born and raised Muslim. And if you, if you might not be familiar with Islam, I think I can give you a little bit of an introduction too. You think that's a good idea, Emma? Yeah, well, that would be wonderful. Okay. I think most of us, uh, certainly on my channel, have a very uh, Christian background or Christian-centric okay. kind of background. Well, I can kind of tell you how Islam was taught to me and how it was presented in relation to the other major religions. So growing up in the Middle East, most people are Muslim, especially in the country where I was in, the UAE. And I was a Sunni Muslim. And when I was being taught about Islam in school, most of my, my uh, education in Islam came in school. Uh, so the way the story goes is that Islam is the final message of the one true God. So this is the same God actually that Christians believe in, that the Jewish people believe in. And what happened was when uh, the Jews and the Christians kind of just started spreading and teaching their religion, the, the true message of God was changed, adulterated and twisted to benefit to the human beings who, let's say, rewrote the Bible. This is what Muslims believe. So God couldn't just stand by and watch this. So he sent one final prophet, one final messenger, who is Muhammad. And Muhammad was in modern day Saudi Arabia, seventh century AD. And so what Muslims believe is that Muhammad was uh, given the perfect word of God. So that's the Quran. And the Quran is the actual literal word of God. This is what Muslims believe as opposed to the, the Bible of Christianity and uh, Judaism, the Old Testament. So in that sense, they're all viewed as part of the same true faith, according mm -hmm. to Muslims. So Muslims believe that Christians and the, the, the Jewish people, they are on the right track their, their religions are just a little bit off and they need to refer to Islam to find out where they were wrong and be better Muslims. That's essentially how they look at it. And this message is meant for all people. So I was also raised to believe that everyone is actually born Muslim. 
everyone was born of the knowledge of this one true God. And what happened is a lot of, a lot of things have been changed and perverted over the millennia. And so you need to Islam to get back on the right track. And so last thing I'll mention just about this, Muslims also believe that Moses is a prophet, a messenger of God, same as Muhammad and same as Jesus. Jesus is believed to, to be a prophet of, of God as well in the same line tradition, going all the way back to Adam, the Adam of Adam and Eve. Uh, one key difference I will say between Christianity and Islam, there are many, but a key difference is Muslims do not believe that Jesus is the son of God that that would be considered a form of idolatry. And Muslims also don't believe that Jesus was actually crucified. So they believe Jesus was put up there on the cross, but he was sent up to heaven before he went through any of the torture stuff. There's a lot of similarities beyond that. A lot of the biblical stories, uh, for example, the story of Noah's Ark uh, and uh, Abraham trying to sacrifice his son to please God are in the Quran as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, story of Sodom and Gomorrah. And yeah, so that's what I was taught. And I would say that I was a full believer. Uh, I believed in heaven and hell and uh, God and that God was actually watching and listening and all of that until I was 18, which is when I left Islam. So what happened when I was 17 is I moved to Canada, which is where I'm at right now, uh, for university. And I had this big, long boring, this is also boring, uh, existential crisis, depression. I told you a little bit about that the other day, Emma, and, uh, it's it not boring. It's not boring. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> not boring. Uh, and it, I called it, I think my emo phase when I was talking to you. So yeah, <laughs> there was a lot of why this, why that, why am I alive? Why am I going to the university? What am I going to do with my life? What's the point of anything? And I think during that depression, I just, re-examined everything that I had taken for granted in my life. And one of those things eventually had to be Islam. And I was always thinking, why is this uh, not giving me the fulfillment and purpose that it should be giving me? Because with Islam, you're taught that your meaning in life is submission to God, worshiping God, doing his commands and avoiding the things he restricts, and then you'll get the reward of paradise. Uh, so that's the point of this life. You're tested. Uh, to do good things and you'll get the reward and you'll avoid the punishment of hell. So uh, it just didn't work for me. And I tried to figure out why. And I, I just came to this conclusion that, well, I don't really see any good reasons, good evidence to believe that this is true. It's just, I've always been told it was true from when I was really, really young. And when you're taught that God is real, hell is real, and all these things are real from a very young age, I think you just naturally trust your parental figures, uh, the people, the adults, let's say, because I mean, they're, they're right about everything else. So why would they be wrong about this? It took about a year before I stopped, uh, before I finally realized if you know what, I'm not Muslim anymore. And so I guess I became an atheist at that point and to jump a couple of years ahead, I just kind of moved on with my life in a secular way. I wasn't religious anymore, but being an ex-Muslim, a uh, former Muslim was not something that I really thought much about. It wasn't really a big part of my identity. Uh, this is a whole long story that I won't get into here, but uh, I basically found out that my parents were just pretending to be Muslim for my benefit because I was living in a Muslim country and they felt it would be bad if I was just going around when I was 10 years old saying, oh, my parents don't believe in God. There's no hell or whatever. There's no heaven. Mm -hmm. So they just pretended and they didn't really reveal it until after I had left. And so with my own immediate family, I didn't really have issues. So because of that, it wasn't really a big preoccupation. My extended family, a lot of them are pretty religious, but I don't see them very often. So it's only an issue during you know, holidays, vacations, that kind of stuff. So it wasn't part of my life until I went into journalism school uh, about seven years ago. And we had this project that we had to do in journalism school, come up with any article you want uh, about any subject you want and write it. And the idea came to me, why don't I do something about ex-Muslims and what they go through? Because I realized that beyond uh, the people within my family, let's say, I don't really know any 
Uh, you don't really hear about ex-Muslims in the news. Uh, there aren't many famous ex-Muslims. One example that might be familiar to people in your audience, maybe to you, is Ayan Hirsi Ali. She was pretty big, uh, maybe five, seven years ago. Uh, she was she was and is a prominent voice in the ex-Muslim community, a controversial one, which we'll get into as well. Mm -hmm. And so I felt like this could be an interesting area to explore something that's been un un untouched. And I found that it was so difficult to find people, ex-Muslims, who are willing to talk about their experiences, willing to share their names or to be photographed even. And so that just opened my eyes to, well, this could be something that I could explore because I love writing. I am a writer and I do live in the relative safety of Canada compared to uh, Muslim countries where it's, it's very dangerous to, to speak out against Islam or even to say that you're no longer Muslim. And so that's what got me into this journey. So I started with just sharing snippets of my own experiences with Islam on social media, on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, you can find me there for that specific one uh, on an account called Leaving Islam. And well, we're living in a day and age where people don't read as much as they used to and people enjoy consuming their content more as videos, which led me to the YouTube channel. And that takes us to the present day. Thank you so much. I think it's... So there's so much that you talked about there that I could go off on a tangent about. I know, so right? Yeah. Um, we need like three days <laughs> of discussion. I think it's one thing I picked up on that I thought of when you started is uh, it's interesting how um, Islam kind of looks to Christianity and Judaism, the way that Christianity looks to Judaism with that. You're sort of on the right track, but you're kind of gone a bit off. You need my religion Precisely. to... It's yeah. funny. It's like the, the trilogy. Of well, the, the what trilogy. I love about Islam, too, is it's right in there that we're the last religion. We're, we're the last. Uh, Muhammad is the last messenger of God. We're the last version you're going to get. So anything that comes after is going to be immediately discredited in their in their in their eyes. It's so interesting. It's funny because on the surface of it, I've always thought it's somewhat it seems more sensical because, you know, the Bible and especially um, like the Pentateuch and it, it's all so old. We don't understand. Some of it is contradictory. It doesn't make sense. It's been translated back and forth so many times. The The only thing that makes sense to me is the idea of God coming back and saying, right, this is what I actually meant. Here you go. Um, so I kind of, I can kind of appreciate it from that perspective. But then as soon as you start going into the, uh, the doctrine and how you take the Quran, it's like, Oh, it's exactly the, the same flaws as Christianity and Judaism. <laughs> so. Well, the, the scary mm. thing is when it comes to things in the Quran, you can't really uh, contort and twist things in it as much as you can with the Bible, I'd say, because mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I think I can't speak for universally for all, let's say, Christians, but there are Christians who take it as the literal word of God. But there's a lot who say, well, clearly this was the work of several people. So we don't have to take it letter by letter as the commands of God. And you don't really have that luxury in Islam. Like if mm -hmm. there's something in the Quran, you better follow it if you're a Muslim. Yeah, which is something that I haven't heard discussed very much, which is a shame. But it's why it's nice that there are some ex-Muslim voices out there that we can try and, you know, raise up a bit and try and uh, learn a little bit. So we do I mean, exist. For my... You do exist. You're out there. Um, from my experience, I like I said at the beginning, it's uh, a very Christian-centric country that I live in. Despite us being far more secular than somewhere like the USA, we don't have a separation of church and state. We are a, a Christian country. The church of England is our is our uh, national religion. So I was brought up secularly by my lovely mum, but with uh, Christianity at the forefront of school and things like that. And uh, my exposure, and I think this is the same for a lot of my friends, uh, including in the kind of atheist community online, my exposure to Islam is in very extremes, right? So you have the, uh, the end of um, Islamic terror attacks, um, that kind of culture of fear that brewed from those, and then the people that suffer extreme Islamophobia, um, so I follow a lot of uh, a lot of the best British MPs actually are, um, I think, because they suffer 
Islamophobia, especially the women also suffer a lot of misogyny related to that. They're very understanding people of uh, struggles and minority groups. So I think that that does at least seem to make for quite understanding MPs. But it seems to be very like every Muslim figure I'm exposed to is either having to come out and show these this repeated Islamophobia, like daily, weekly, whatever, or it's seen as um, somebody who's, you know, on the extreme end of like terror attacks. There's not much of a just average Muslim, you know, uh, certainly not on TV and things like that. When I was younger, it's, it's one of those things where it's either like something that you struggle with because of hate and bigotry or something that's dangerous and, and frightening. And I think that's related to the kind of Christian upbringing. Um, and I've been asked a few times about uh, talking about Islam. Why, why haven't you talked about Islam? And I get, I get a lot of recommendations for content and stuff from comments. Um, so that is a, not a shame to admit, that is a big source of inspiration for me. Every time I get a comment that is like, why don't you, haven't you talked about Islam? It tends to be from a disgruntled Christian person who feels that their faith is being attacked and uh, they essentially are just hoping to push that a perceived attack onto a group they don't like instead. So I'm aware that Islamophobia is a real problem in the UK. I don't want to inadvertently feed that and I don't want to feed it to bigoted people who just want that because they feel their religion is better and shouldn't be attacked but somebody else's should be. So that's sort of why I haven't touched on it very much. The other reason just as I say is because I haven't been exposed to it very much. Um, we did a little bit of Islam in school as much as we did like hinduism and buddhism so that's all gone from here oh, so more like the 15 the years ago comparative religion kind of courses that kind of stuff yeah you know we did religious education as like a, a class but it was like 80 percent christianity and then 20 percent here are other religions but that's just part of church of england schools i think so that's kind of why i've not touched on islam so much it's definitely something i would like to look into more the other reason that I talk about Christianity so much, of course, is that it, like I say, impacts my country and uh, a lot of the world uh, that I'm, you know, I, I have a stake in where my family and my friends live um, the most. And I know the Bible, certainly I've picked up the Bible a lot more times than I've ever picked up a Quran, which might be, you know, once <laughs> in a library. So that's kind of where I'm at. I want to make sure that I'm giving Islam the fair criticism that it deserves without feeding any Islamophobia that is often, because I think this is a problem and we can talk about this in a bit, but I think part of the problem with Islamophobia is that it's a term that is not universally agreed upon and it kind of can cross over with racism a bit, which I thought was interesting. I was looking at some of the history of uh, Islamophobia in the UK and it's essentially just people mixing up Islam with Arabs and <laughs> just being racist or even but hopefully brown people I guess just just brown yeah. people in general yeah but I think this is a valuable discussion to have to try and challenge some of those things so I think if we start off talking a little bit about that Islamophobia you had a, yes. um, a term or a definition from the Ontario Human Rights Commission I think that you uh, preferred I I do yeah to your point there isn't really one single universal definition of islamophobia that you know everyone uses although it's a term that you'll find in articles constantly all over all over the place mm -hmm. there really isn't that one definition so the reason i mentioned this one is because i felt like it it's close to what i think it should be and i should mention that there is a conversation about whether there the the term should exist in the first place and maybe it just should just be something like uh, anti-Muslim bigotry. And we'll get into mm -hmm. why those semantics exist in, in a little bit, but I'll give you the definition. So this is the Ontario Human Rights Commission's definition. So Islamophobia can be described as stereotypes 
bias, or acts of hostility towards individual Muslims or followers of Islam in general. In addition to individual acts of intolerance and racial profiling, Islamophobia leads to viewing Muslims as a greater security threat on an institutional, systemic, and societal level. Whoa, that's some <laughs> definition. You can tell it's one of those definitions where this whole big think tank of people, like 20 people all sat around and like, no, not that word, use that word. And they probably just had a big board yeah. that they were just throwing things on. Yeah, um, for sure. So viewing Islamophobia with that definition, first thing I should mention, speaking as an ex-Muslim and someone from an Arab background is, Islamophobia definitely exists. It's real. You can see it. You can see it throughout the Western world. You can see it in high tension areas like, let's say, India, where there's a lot of clashes between Hindus and Muslims. It's definitely real. So I guess the next question then becomes, what are the dangers of Islamophobia for, for Muslims? And I think that's something that uh, you, you had a few examples you want to talk about in the UK first, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, sure. Like I said, I, I follow a few MPs uh, who are Muslim and the mayor of London is also um, Muslim, Sadiq Khan. And uh, you can't you can't go. It made me laugh. It's just a slight tangent, but I, um, you know, he pops up on Facebook with his green initiatives and it's about, you know, um, the environment in London or petrol taxes, whatever. And you can't see a post like that without seeing somebody tell him to go back to where he came from or something like that. And um, there's an MP, I really like the MP for Coventry, um, Zara Sultana. She shared, I think last year, she shared some of the emails that she got, some of the Islamophobic emails. And like I said, there's a lot of crossover with uh, misogyny there. Um, she's lifted up some other female MPs that um, have had the the same issues, and uh, and so she's been very proactive in uh, fighting Islamophobia and sharing as public figures. Especially, it's it's interesting because we've had violence against MPs as an issue in the last few years in this country. So combining that with the levels of Islamophobia and the sexism, um, it, it almost feels quite dangerous uh, for those people to be public figures. Do you wanna share a little bit about Canada before I go sure. too far tangentially off into British politics? Sure. Well, the thing, the thing, I, I, what I would say is that there's this perception of Canada and it is true in many regards that Canada is one of the most uh, multicultural countries in the world. Uh, there's immigrants from, like, I mean, just in Toronto alone, there is uh, immigrants from every conceivable country here, really. Uh, within the same neighborhood, you can find people of various faiths, people from virtually every continent. But despite that being reality, it's not as if it's all smooth sailing. And there are a lot of issues with Islamophobia and just... I would just say plain old xenophobia here in Canada. You'll see it more in the rural areas uh, than the cities, which I think is probably just true, generally speaking, wherever you go. Um, so here's my thing with the Islamophobia problem. So in Canada, you can see it just visibly because for whatever reason, Canada has had a series of like really brutal, horrifying attacks against Muslims. There was this terrible shooting that happened in Quebec City, I believe it was uh, five years ago, uh, where just a gunman came in and shot up the mosque and killed a bunch of people. And there was another horrible incident that happened last year in London, Ontario, not London, England, uh, where someone just literally took a truck and ran over a family and killed, I think, four of them. So there, those things happen Every now and then, I'm not really sure why, uh, definitely motivated against Muslims specifically. I think it has a lot to do with a lot of the frustrations that people in the West have, where they just see immigrants coming in and there's this whole, you know, perception of, uh, to, to, to quote South Park, if anyone's a South Park fan, they, they took our jobs. They took our jobs. Yeah. yeah. So it's just a classic also thing of, that you could see with the Jewish people of, let's blame these outsiders for our problem as the Nazis did famously. Mm -hmm. 
uh, tragically, in Germany in the 1930s and 40s. And so they're just seen as a target because they're different. They come from a different place. And there's a lot of Muslims. Islam is the second biggest religion in the world. I think there's 2 billion Muslims in the world. And here's the second part of it. And I think this is something that is real. I'm not saying that Islamophobia is right, uh, obviously, but there are differences in values between Muslims and a lot of people in the West. You can see this when it comes to things like um, the treatment of women, uh, uh, LGBTQ rights, uh, in what your purpose in life, in uh, the importance of family. There, there's, there's a lot of things that I think uh, people in the West see that are troubling about Islamic practices. And so instead of trying to learn more about it or trying to connect with Muslims on the things that unite us rather than divide us, it's just ostracize them, demonize them, and be afraid of them. And you see that in Canada all the time. One example I wanted to mention to you that what I thought was really interesting was, this was a few years ago, um, and this was, I believe, when uh, uh, previous, before Trudeau was prime minister, Stephen Harper was our conservative prime minister, obviously nowhere near as conservative as uh, the the leaders in the US these days. Uh, and there was this idea that came up of having a barbaric practices tip line or hotline. And the idea of it was uh, to give people an opportunity to report uh, really troubling behavior uh, by your neighbors or by whomever. Uh, and it was clearly a very thinly veiled attempt to just try to get people to talk about Muslims doing strange things. Like everyone, like no one said it out loud, but it was very, uh, very clear. It was these, these Muslims are doing these very intolerant things. We won't accept it. So here's an actual tip line. And the climate in Canada is such that even if there are some legitimate concerns, it was, it was immediately dismissed as Islamophobic, horrible, and maybe people even called the barbaric tip line idea barbaric in its, in of itself. And so I would say that's the climate we're in in Canada right now, where uh, although there are Islamophobic people, there are Islamophobic politicians in Canada, and there are some arguably Islamophobic uh, laws in place. For example, there is a ban on wearing uh, hijabs, not, spe not specifically hijabs, but religious headwear or religion identifying items in, in mm -hmm. Quebec. But again, people say, well, this is clearly something that is specifically targeting Muslims. So these things exist. But for the most part, the climate is to really fight against Islamophobia and really support Muslims and trying to be inclusive. It's interesting. There's a lot of similarity, I think, between the UK and Canada in uh, the kind of the roots and the handling of Islamophobia. We definitely uh, we definitely have had a lot of the same scapegoating issues where Muslims would have just been the next group. I, there was this one amazing time Fox News called uh, Birmingham the City, I think it was Birmingham in a uh, city in the UK, 100% uh, Muslim, which is extremely funny, wow. especially to the people of Birmingham who are obviously mostly not Muslim. <laughs> but yeah, it's looking into the history of Islamophobia in the UK is so interesting because so much of it originated in oil. I wish that was more well known because it's such a sad capitalist dystopian reason to uh, now hate people where the original reason has been sort of forgotten and just the hatred has, has remained. Mm -hmm. um, so I've got I've got some interesting stats just because there's some fun conspiracies that are kind of contributing to Islamophobia in the UK. And uh, I love talking about conspiracies. So these kind of caught my attention. More than one in four, one in four people hold conspiratorial views about Sharia no-go areas. This is the idea that there are parts of the UK that are secretly operating under Sharia law and non-Muslims aren't allowed to go there, hence the no-go area. Like there's secret walled off communities that you can't access uh, because they're take, they're taking over. Um, it's a very it's a very classic conspiratorial 
Um, yeah, 26.5% of the British public agree that there are areas in Britain that operate under Sharia law where non-Muslims are not allowed to enter, which is obviously not true. Sharia councils exist in the UK, I found out, um, but they're more a sort of local advisory boards. They don't have any power over domestic law. They couldn't instruct you to do anything that would uh, contradict with domestic UK law um, because there's no that's not a legal force it's just some sort of an advisory board for Muslims this is a quote that I thought was interesting the no-go zones theory which is spread by global far-right pundits online has been widely debunked and where there have been isolated incidents of Muslim patrols suspects have been arrested and condemned by local Muslim leaders so it's uh it's a case of certain uh, individuals who use their religion in a negative way, the people basically that we want to criticize and uh, the way they're using religion and the religion that they're using, trying to, uh, it sort of benefits them as well as benefits the Islamophobes in uh, making a kind of scapegoaty statement about this whole group, which leads to Islamophobia, but it also leads to making it harder for people like ex-Muslims to have a voice and making it more difficult to talk about Islam in a way that feels safe. And I mean, we'll um, we'll talk a little bit uh, in a bit about people who have suffered certain consequences or nearly suffered certain consequences from saying things that aren't particularly controversial, but they're saying things about Islam or Muslims. So it's bred a very weird environment where people are either very comfortable talking about Islam in that they will happily talk about how they hate all Muslims and they should all get out of the country or whatever, or people aren't don't feel comfortable even coming out as an ex-Muslim or criticizing their religion at all, which I think is interesting uh, in a way that is a little bit concerning. <laughs> yeah, and I would say the the third category, which is the majority of people, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, are the ones who just want to really support Islam and say this is Islam is one of the, the world's biggest religions and uh, we should treat them equally and we should celebrate this religion and celebrate our diversity and mm -hmm. really, really fight any kind of backlash that uh, this religion gets because it's sourced from bigotry, racism, prejudice, from Islamophobia. And I would really say that's the majority of people and because that's the majority as you mentioned, whoever's left is either um, a bigot or an invisible ex-Muslim <laughs> or the ex-Muslims are lumped in as the bigots. It's difficult. And, uh, you know, we've we talked about prior to this and even I was chatting to my partner about it. We said, do you think you're going to get any backlash, any hate from just talking about Islam? I think probably. But it shouldn't be that way to have an open conversation about how do we critique this religion the same way we critique other religions. I think it's, but I, but I think that's interesting in how it's different. That uh, provides an interesting discussion for itself. So saying that, let's move on to what do we think are the problems? What are the major, just a, a sort of sweeping overview? What do we think are the problems the threats that Islam as a religion poses, what are the major concerns we have about the doctrine and the followers? And this why is, is the it part bad? this is the part <laughs> where the video is gonna get taken down, isn't it? <laughs> um I, I I joke about that, but it is actually like a legitimate issue that a lot of uh ex-Muslims like myself who are active on social media are facing, where uh, it's it's well, let's put it this way. So I'll give you my concerns with Islam that I, I would actually say uh, you'll find a lot of those concerns within Christianity as well. So they're not exclusive to Islam mm -hmm. whatsoever. And I'll just show this to you first from just my own upbringing. So uh, as I mentioned, I was born and raised Muslim. And so an important part of Islam, as I mentioned, that you're being tested in this life so you can uh determine your fate in the much more important afterlife so th there's two problems with this part of it so the thing about islam is it kind of by prioritizing the afterlife so much it really takes away 
the importance of this life. What you're taught is this life is ephemeral, it's fleeting, uh, the things in it don't matter as much, the possessions you accrue. And I think you could also say that the relationships you have aren't as important, especially when it comes to your relationship with God, because that's what is most important ultimately. Mm -hmm. And that can have really scary consequences when you truly believe that as, as I did. So as I mentioned earlier, there's the, the story of Abraham, who, who is a prophet in the Islamic tradition. Uh, they call him Ibrahim in Arabic. So there's this famous story, which you might be familiar with, where uh, Abraham is, I think he dreams or is commanded in a dream, something like that, uh, to, to sacrifice his son as a gesture of his faith in God. Mm -hmm. And so Abraham is right about to do it. He has his son on the, on the slab ready to be slaughtered. And well, happy ending to the story. Well, depending on how you look at a happy ending, um, God swoops in. He sends, I think he sends an angel or something like that. I'm, I can't remember the specifics, but basically God says, you don't actually have to do this. Just sacrifice this animal instead. And so what I was taught about the story that was important was this shows that your devotion to God should be above all else, even, even when it comes to sacrificing your own child. And this story has been interpreted to, in many various ways to go away from that obviously very uncomfortable interpretation. But this interpretation is the most common one and is the one that I was taught. Mm -hmm. And you can see right there what the hazards of actually thinking this way are. I don't have to really illustrate in any more detail. It can be very dangerous to believe that sort of thing. And tied to the afterlife as well is just this whole notion of everything you have to do is about this heaven and hell. And so when you're teaching kids, like I was when I was a kid, about this stuff, about hell, and you're going to be punished and go to hell if you, you're too much of a sinner, it's terrifying. If you really believe hell is, a, is a, a real thing that you could be in for, I don't know, a long, long time, if, if not eternity, then you're, it's going to also impact you in all of these uh, traumatizing ways. I can tell you that I had nightmares because of it. I would, I would have like mini little panic attacks about seeing something in the news that uh, was a sign of the judgment day, the, the doomsday, the end times, uh, because I'd, I'd be worrying, well, I'm, I'm not, I haven't done enough good deeds. I've done too many sins. I'm going to, I'm going to go to hell. I'm going to have all these horrible things happen to me. And the one example that always stuck to my mind, and this is in the Quran is this torture that you're going to get by having your skin burnt off and then regrown to be burnt off again. Oh, God. So this is taught to kids, lots of kids all over the world. Mm -hmm. And obviously that's going to have a, a negative impact. And it also brings up the question, that, which is like the classic philosophical one, is something good because uh, it's a good thing and you should do it for its own sake? Or are you doing good things and avoiding the bad things, if you want to call them bad things, just to please this God to get into heaven and avoid hell so mm -hmm. i think that's a very dangerous way to frame your morality as well but it's it's the template that a lot of theists believe morality is built on that's the yeah. basis of abrahamic religion really isn't it yeah yeah i mean um we we looked at uh, some jehovah's witness materials a little while ago and it's very much that like the next life is the one that matters so I mean, I specifically watched a video for teenagers that was explaining why you shouldn't do what you love and what you're passionate about, because it's all about the next life. I mean, all their materials are like that. And that is woven into so many of these religions. And I, that, I think that's really sad. It really is. The, the, you know what is the, the saddest thing to me? Mm -hmm. it's, the, it's the people who, whose sexuality doesn't conform with what their religion teaches. And yeah. again, this is something that's similar between Christianity and, and, and Islam. I always think of people who, let's say, let's say a hypothetical Muslim who's born and finds, uh, let's say he's, he's male and he finds himself attracted to men. Your, uh, and your identity then, the thing that you can't help being, is something that is considered unnatural. And mm -hmm. according to a lot of Muslim tradition, an abomination, something that you're going to go to hell for but you can't help it. So can, can you imagine the self-loathing 
that you must go through the confusion and that this is happening all over the world. There are, there are uh, gay Muslims, there are queer Muslims, there's a lot of Muslims who identify that way. I would say in contravention of a lot of what the Islamic tradition is and what Islam teaches, but they must carry some baggage as well because, because of their attempts to try and reconcile all of that. Let's say most people don't fall in the LGBTQ com uh, community or umbrella. If you want to just talk about uh, heterosexual people, Islam, and I think to a lesser extent Christianity, but Islam more so, really teaches you to stifle your sexuality in a very unhealthy, unnatural way. Um, I mean, I, I won't get to go into too much detail about this here either, but you're taught things like the, just the simple act of masturbation is one of the, is a horrible thing to do, terrible thing to do. And so even just like exploring your own sexuality is something that is a taboo. Looking mm -hmm. at other looking at uh, other women when you're not married, being attracted to other women it, from the male perspective, male heterosexual perspective is considered a bad thing. And how can we forget the whole issue of the hijab or the woman having to cover herself to some extent, there's varying interpretations on how much a woman should cover herself. So what we're telling women is, this is this is what I was taught too. Women, the problem is men find you attractive and men are capable of doing these terrible things. So what's the solution? Hide yourself so they aren't tempted by you. So I've heard arguments that this is supposed to be an argument for you know empowering women uh, by them not being sexualized anymore, taking away the objectification of women. And I don't see it that way. It's actually doing something much worse. It's saying you are such a sex object that you have to hide yourself. You have to erase yourself uh, visually to not be that anymore. If anything, mm -hmm. it's, it's like, instead of addressing the problem, it's, uh, just burying the problem. There's no problem here. Just, let's just cover it with a hijab or a niqab or a burqa or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and how does that feel? I, that's something I can't relate to. How does that feel to be a woman and to be taught these things from a young age? And like you say, all of the things you've mentioned are things that I have found problematic in Christianity. Um, and to the extent that I've looked into it, Judaism as well. Islam is definitely one that you see more, you know, from my outsider's kind of perspective, you see more uh, sort of in the news um, because there are still uh, places where being an atheist or being converted to another religion other than Islam is uh, illegal, you know, punishable in some serious way. The same with being gay or something like that. I think we can forget because we're so used to, even though it's a very recent push for a more tolerant world in terms of like the LGBTQ plus community and things like that, we can kind of forget that a lot of places are still what we would consider in the past. And a lot of it is because of things like religion, especially Islam. I'll have to do some digging and find uh, some, maybe some Muslim or some ex-Muslim women who are, uh, are open to discussing uh, things like how women are treated and expected to dress and things like that in Islam because and I can definitely recommend some to you as well. Oh, that would be fantastic. Yeah. Um, it's, it's just to me as like a grew up in England, gung ho white feminist lady, to me, it doesn't make sense. It, it, it would never make sense to me. And it's the same reason I would never be a Christian or, you know, probably any other theistic religion, but it doesn't make sense to me to choose to be in a religion that treats women like they are lesser or something to hide or you know very well said